Hello, and welcome to today's episode of Scurf Interviews. Uh, this is the first episode in our first mini-series on governance, and we're specifically going to be exploring the intersection of culture and incentives and how those questions impact governance overall in decentralized ecosystems. Uh, and I'm really excited and thankful to get to kick off this mini-series uh, with Abby Tickcomb from Radical and Nathan Schneider from CU Boulder. And I'll give each one of you a moment to introduce yourselves, and then we can jump right into the conversation. So Abby, do you mind kicking us off with a quick intro? Not at all. Thanks for having me. My name is Abby. I'm the head of community at Radical. Um, Radical is a Web3 network for collaboration. Uh, specifically, it uh, provides uh, developers with a decentralized way to uh, collaborate on code together. Um, it's a hybrid crypto project. It's on one hand, it's a hardcore peer-to-peer -peer network built on top of Git that allows people to host and share Git repositories with each, uh, each other. And on the other hand, it's um, a, a light Ethereum integration that allows developers to use um, crypto economic primitives like multi-sigs and NFTs uh, to coordinate open source development and fund their open source work. Great. Thank you for sharing. And Nathan, do you mind giving us a quick bio before we get the conversation going? Sure. I'm Nathan Schneider. I'm a professor of media studies at the University of Colorado Boulder, and I uh, run the Media Enterprise Design Lab here. Um, we do work on uh, democratic ownership and governance, um, ranging from uh, you know old school cooperatives and news organizations and things like that to um, to to crypto projects. And I've been involved in um, conversations and research on um, crypto governance ever since, you know, I first read the Ethereum white paper in early 2014 and, um, you know, had my mind blown like, like a bunch of other people uh, about the possibilities. And it's been really fun uh, over the last few years to see some of those possibilities in their utopian and dystopian forms start to, uh, to become realities. Yeah, and I'm excited to get right into the the question of with some of these realities, what role uh, the the very frequently ephemeral uh, element of culture can play in these environments. So yeah, I'd love to just start with the direct question of what do you what role do you see culture playing in decentralized ecosystems? I can take a stab at that first. Um, I think that uh, culture is almost everything for decentralized systems. I think that um, uh, similar to the free and open source movement. Um, uh, one driven by the culture of uh, uh, free software, um, you know, not free as in uh, free beer, but free as in free freedom, um, is it, culture drives uh, technological movements. And, and in Web3, the culture of decentralization uh, and liberation and freedom in the form of uh, personal control, trust, um, uh, uh, don't trust, verify, right? That's what it is. <laughs> if I'm getting the slogan right. Um, is the ethos that is driving um, a wave of new technology. And so I think that this ideological culture, which is something that uh, builders and creators can opt into, is something that drives technology uh, that challenges traditional institutions that have defined mainstream culture. Um, so specifically with the Web3 movement, it's challenging the centralized platforms that have built um, their corporations and and have driven you know our day-to-day -day online experience uh, with certain values of uh, centralization of trust um, and of extraction and in, in the same way that those uh, that technology has embedded those values uh, within mainstream culture um, you know web3 is using these uh, alternative uh, culture drivers to bring forth a new uh, wave of technology. And so I think that culture is incredibly important for being able to not only uh, do the hard thing, which is uh, build against traditional systems, but um, keep developing new technology that can steward new futures um, uh, within you know, the vision of the internet. Don't trust verify um, bit, I think, is, is, is an interesting one because it is part of this culture for sure. Um, you know, that it, almost to a fault, almost to excess beyond necessity, people are trying to build in these systems that, you know, even when there's just a few people using them that are scalable to people that they don't have to trust. At the same time, I'm always interested in the respect to which, um, w in which people are in fact using culture as a means of trust. Um, 
and and uh, uh, using these kinds of cultural signals and signposts um, as culture has always been used to cultivate a sense of, okay, we're in the same team. We're on the same, you know, uh, uh, mission here. You know, we can trust each other while we try to figure out how to make this system work. And I think there's, there, there's an important respect there in which trust is this necessary glue that allows projects to get going um, and to have some traction and some some growth and development in a context where um, where not everything has been figured out and 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 that has to be okay we have to be able to work without having figured everything out and so when you look at you know the meme culture of um, of crypto projects when you look at you know just the the words there's so much jargon that has to be explained um, you know the religion of Moloch you know this whole kind of um, this whole kind of network of systems, you know, that when I, you know, present this stuff to my students, I have to unpack like so much language um, that is embedded in this culture and, and, and language in this context, as in so many other human contexts, serves as a kind of glue. If you know the language, you know, you're somebody who there's more likelihood that you can trust this person to do a bunch of other things that you yourself would want to do um, because you both have taken the time to learn this this shared language. Um, so so you know it, it, it also provides this this means of actually enabling people to trust before they can verify. I really love that point because it really is um, you know describing really lore, right? Like there is this kind of like shared crypto lore within different ecosystems uh, that uh, people subscribe to and uh, align their own values with. And I think that this is also why we've seen um, differences between different uh, crypto ecosystems, you know, and, and tribalism between the two is that you actually see this natural inclination to uh, people who share certain values outside of uh, their their work, um, and you find that that's actually deeply powerful because the values of the people building the technology become embedded in the technology itself, um, and so it's the trust, right, that keeps people building things in uncertain territory, but it's also, um, you know, very powerful because now you have the ability to influence the technology that you're designing, and I think that that's very much so what we're seeing as, you know, the crypto space right now, although there's a lot of mainstream aspects of it um, generated and uh, defined by their hype count, you know, there's also like a lot of really great experimentation right now at, where people are just throwing things at the wall, sticking and then forking and doing something else. And so you see that the culture of crypto is also compounded on the open source sharing that came before it. And so there's like a lot of embedded lore um, that has <laughs> memed itself into reality and is now taking shape. I think we're finally seeing certain things take shape as people start to use and start to, uh, well, I think some people would argue if some people are, if, if it's actually being used, um, but I think we're really starting to see some of those values and, and culture take shape um, as crypto starts becoming more mainstream. And, the, you know, I, I mean, that question about what are people using is so, you know, is so central to this, like, what what is it other than culture in so many projects that is making people even bother to use this stuff? I mean, in 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 some cases, I think there are moments where okay, there's a thing or two you can do that you can't do without this tool. But in in a lot of cases, you know, uh, uh, adoption is is nudged by culture. You know, I'm adopting this tool because I have a cultural commitment to to doing things this way rather than that way. Um, to using radical rather than GitHub, and um, and and the culture, you know, again drives participation in a way that that the pure logic of economic incentives and you know technical protocols and um, particular affordances of systems, which people are working toward and trying to build, nevertheless are themselves insufficient. And a perfect example of that, which is actually kind of non-crypto related, is uh, you know Linus Torvalds, and the reason that he built Git, he built Git, was because you know he built Git 
um, which is a distributed version control system, an open source distributed version control system in retaliation because the distributed version control system that he was using to develop Linux uh, became closed source. He had to start paying for it. And so uh, an engineer, a Linux engineer, engineer actually reverse engineered that distributed version control protocol and, and thus Git was born, which is... Um, probably the most widely used uh, version control system that drives all open source software development of today. And so you see that these like larger ideological uh, decisions um, define culture and then that culture compounds on itself and becomes things that are like very real um, that then are able to trigger externalities that I guess you could say are kind of lie outside of culture. They drive adoption, uh, they create markets and so on. Well, the, and Git, Git's a really interesting example, um, you know, because it's something, you know, I've, I've tried to understand, you know, I've been doing research on like, what is the goal, what are the governance biases in different technologies that people use to collaborate? And Git is, a, you know, a fascinating one because it is, in some respects, a total power vacuum. Um, the way Git is, is set up, it doesn't tell you, you know, who has permissions over over a certain code base you know you download it you can do whatever you want with you know you can fork the thing you can you can run with it um, and it's an extremely you know it 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 it, it dictates so little about how power flows in a community of users and as a result it means that it turns to those users culture um, and other technical practices that they might use in order to layer on top of it, okay, how are we going to actually govern, you know, this shared asset? Um, and, 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 and this is the case, you know, with a lot of technologies, but then you look at something like GitHub, which then does layer on a permission system and says, okay, we're going to have a top-down permission system. And this is, you know, how we're going to govern Git. Lots of times it's an email list. Um, you know, in, in the case of, of the Linux project itself that Git was first created for, right, there was already a culture built of a, you know, of a certain kind of very blunt and, um, kind of, so-called meritocratic re relationship with a single founder who still holds, you know, a kind of dictatorship role in it. Um, and it's interesting how in, in that case, a lot of that is not dictated by the technology, but a culture formed around it. And, and, and then you see a project like Python, you know, using a lot of the same tools that um, had a similar, um, you know, kind of dictator relationship, and then has had to transition into into other kinds of um, cultural and governance practices around that same technology. And so I guess a question responding to both of you then is sort of in the process of if you're in charge of planning or building, or you're just happening to launch a new DAO or doing anything where, you know, you have to now think of the governance aspects that are relevant to, to the goal that you're trying to accomplish, when is the right time to start thinking about culture then? Or if you're asking yourself the question, it's too late because it already started before and now you're just trying to figure out where it's at and what it means. And so the chicken and the egg problem with culture, it seems like the starting point is always very challenging. It might, I don't know, do you see it as emergent? Uh, yeah. I would say it's in part emergent, but it needs active uh, thought and, and deliberation because uh, very quickly culture can appear through, um, you know, because I, I do think culture is multidimensional. I'll say this first. I think that what we just spoke about was ideological culture, right? Um, you know, the, the reason why driven, you know, what drives a movement, um, decentralization, liberation, like freedom, but there's also like working culture. And I think that this is how people work together, how people create together, how people communicate. And I think that working culture sometimes is more, impactful on a project's overall culture than the ideological culture itself. And I think that two people can share values um, and uh, subscribe to a certain ideological culture, but have vastly different means of working culture. And if they are partic if they're contributing and driving working culture, then I think that you'll see not a schism because it's not always binary, um, but you'll see certain values um, emerge through the way um, that the community is interacting with each other. And so I think that to combat um, 
I mean, in combat, uh, I would say harmful culture, uh, I guess, um, which is, again, a very subjective process. Um, for, for me to do that, I've been trying to um, subscribe to open and, openness and accessibility as uh, two driving uh, values of working culture within the Radical Project. And so if you're able to have a mandate that um, a, a project should... Uh, of a project's working culture, you're able to craft the spaces within um, the project, the social, you're able to lay the social infrastructure um, and design it in a way that um, is, is welcoming and uh, encourages um, working culture within those values. And I really do think that like openness and accessibility are two of like the biggest drivers um, within open source communities in general. And I know that I, when starting to design Radical's infrastructure, there was a lot of reading and trying to understand how and what best practices to subscribe to to ensure that we're creating an open and accessible space for this culture to develop. So I think it's half and half. I think you have to be thinking about it from the start and you have to be at least evaluating what culture exists and understanding as if there is a certain uh, vision for where we want culture to go. Um, but it's also incredibly emergent and it there needs to be kind of more active evaluation in space to be reflecting on what the, that culture is and how it's contributing to a project's success um, or, um, you know, sustainability. Yeah, what you're saying there reminds me of, um, you know, the story of the Contributor Covenant, you know, which is a widely used um, code of conduct in open source projects, right, where Corlin Edemke, among many other people, you know, who experienced you know, really kind of hostile behavior in open source spaces. Um, and, you know, this is particularly an issue, uh, you know, around gender um, and and sexual harassment. And, and you know, there was, there was a sense of emergent culture in a lot of these communities that was very strong, um, but these communities were very male dominated. And so many of the people in positions of power just did not experience or see or have to viscerally confront what was going on. And, uh, and yet they had this feeling that, you know, there is, you know, we have a strong culture, we can handle this stuff, we don't need more rules, we don't need more intentional crafting, we don't want to lose that emergent quality. And, um, Corlin and others just insisted, no, we need to make code of codes of conduct explicit. You know, I'm not going to go to a conference that doesn't have a code of conduct that, you know, that that protects me explicitly against um, certain kinds of abuse that I've experienced. And um, and 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 that was a it was a a point of incredible tension for a long time. Right. Where we're communities just did not want to, their leaders did not want to make, do the work of making, you know, cultural norms explicit. And finally, um, you know, there's been a kind of ongoing process where people have been waking up to recognize that that is actually, it doesn't work that way. It's not going to happen. And, um, and these kinds of abuses need to be confronted explicitly. We need to be intentional. Um, and, and, you know, open source has been, and, and free software in particular, you know, the Free Software Foundation is a, you know, an example of this, a, a place that has harbored, you know, a lot of abusive practices and has resisted efforts to, you know, to do that, that um, explicit community cultivation. Um, uh, but at the same time, uh, that, that community or that, that um, contributor covenant that, that Corinne Linnae designed, you know, has now been very, very widely adopted um, across many, many projects, including Linux and, and many others that have been kind of havens of abusive behavior. Um, and in, in the crypto world, you know, one case that comes to mind, too, is um, one that I've been studying um, as part of my work on crypto economics, which is OneHive, which is a DAO um, that, you know, is building a lot of tools for other DAOs and sort of thing, a really vibrant community. And, um, and, you know, I was really running in my early writing on it on the basis of things that it said on the website, right? It, um, for instance, you go to the about page and it says, honey is money. Honey is the name of their token. And you look at the, the main, you know, onehive.org, it's like you see charts, you know, you see like things relating to economic flows. So, you know, I thought, okay, wow, this is a community that is really focused on its economic logics and its economic flows. And then, you know, I, I write this 
share drafts and people in that community are like, no, 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 you're totally misunderstanding how, you know, how we think of ourselves. Um, and, and that was a really interesting disconnect to encounter, right? Where, where the people involved see it as, you know, a culture that is very dis detached from the kind of, um, incentivization of everything and the, the, you know, and, and, and kind of economic rewards, even though a lot of the stuff that happens to end up on the websites when you, when you arrive, um, gives one that impression. And so that, you know, it's another danger, I think, of, um, of, of not kind of intentionally uh, uh, crafting that culture. Um, at the same time, there's something so you know, powerful and dynamic about the spontaneous cultures that emerge in, in these communities. And so it's, it's always a balance of how do you, you know, make sure to honor that spontaneity and that, that unpredictability while also, um, well also, you know, really comes down the most important questions are how do you make people safe? And, um, how do you make sure that, that the edge cases that really matter for everything, um, and that, and that determine who's going to come in and who's going to be driven out, who's going to get hurt, um, are really at the center uh, of, of, of how you craft the culture. Yeah. And to double click on the, the covenant, right? The, these uh, materials uh, become standardized in a way that they can be cloned and used in any project. And I think that that's incredibly powerful to be able to be presented with then something that resembles an ideological culture that um, you and your project wants to subscribe to. And you're able to do that communally um, by adopting a standard is a very powerful way to uh, collectively, not just as an individual, like as an individual project, but to collectively uh, subscribe to a culture. And I think a lot of, we see a lot of that happening um, ad hoc kind of in the crypto space because it's so new and so emergent. Um, but I think that focusing on how to develop those best practices um, within governance, uh, things that can be easily shared and forked and cloned um, from project to project that um, uh, are ways to express values are really powerful. And I think that in, on the other side, I think that really culture rears its head. People realize that there's a culture issue or... Um, uh, or what a culture is when when conflicts arise, you know what I mean? It's it's kind of hard to evaluate a culture when when everything's okay, right? And you don't really evaluate um, those issues until uh, you have these conflicts, um, whether they be social conflicts or I think more and more we'll see crypto projects dealing with the nature of their financialization and uh, stakeholder interests versus social interests. Because I think that one of the most powerful drivers of culture, of course, are the people contributing to a project, right? And I think that a great way to define and cultivate culture is to have someone who's directly focused on that, community managers, uh, developer evangelists, people, these roles are actually people who become embedded in the culture of the project that they're contributing to and are able to craft and cultivate the one-on-one -on -one relationships between contributors and manage conflicts between contributors and maintainers if we're looking at it in a traditional open source sense. Um, but more and more, I think what's interesting is that, and I think what I think of when uh, Nathan, you were talking about, I was thinking about the recent MakerDAO drama that happened in the discourse forum, where you're starting to see social conflicts arise in uh, governance processes and are uh, being evaluated from uh, it technically evaluated within the processes that are laid out within an organization and starting to see that it's really hard to actually um, deal with some of these uh, these conflicts. This, this specific conflict uh, I'm mentioning is... Um, a large that one of the, the founder of uh, MakerDAO, a large maker holder, uh, suggesting to offboard a maker contributor uh, via a governance proposal in the forum, and a lot of. Uh, participants in governance saying, is this how this is supposed to happen? And then trying to grapple with the this, uh, you know, approach and trying to contextualize and understand how this is actually supposed to happen, knowing that this is something that potentially uh, incentive uh, stakeholders uh, who have are financially incentivized would be willing to do. And so I think that more and more as these protocol ecosystems mature, we'll start to see these conflicts that are probably going to be very closely related to stakeholder incentives, um, rear their head. And we're going to have to, and culture is kind of the only real way in the social infrastructure that is uh, drives culture is going to be the only real way to 
create systems that can remain resilient to those, you know, external motivations. There's something you said there too about the the cloning of of rules um, is is really important. I mean, th- this is something that that you know we see in offline life a lot, right? Corporate boards, um, you know, community organizations, um, you know, that they resemble each other. If you look at the bylaws of lots of different kinds of civic organizations, they, they're more similar than different, right? And I think part of that is is actually a cultural reason, is that, 80, you know, I, I kind of use as a rule of thumb that 80% of governance is culture um, and, and only 20% is the rules. And, um, and, and the trouble is, is, is if every rule set is different, um, you know, people come into the space not knowing what culture to build on top of that. Um, whereas if you have some uniformity, you know, then people can come in, they know most of the of the norms um, that are built on top of those rules. And, you know, they can start operating and there might be some small differences from organization to organization. But that sense of that sense of, of the recognition that culture is kind of governance culture is a protocol that has to be able to translate across multiple organizations, especially, you know, when you think about the aspiration of you know, say being a member of like dozens of DAOs, right? If if we're going to live our lives in these like ownership relationships that cascade across our, you know, different domains of interest um, and economic life, you know, we're going to have to participate in multiple organizations. And that means not just, you know, attending to the culture of that organization, but actually how do we cultivate um, kind of shared understandings across organizations so that people can you know, more or less easily move from from one to the other. Um, that's also, you know, a challenge. And I think it's, you know, it's also a reason you see a lot of forking in in um, uh, in, in crypto land. In addition to being able to build on the technical benefits of a, a certain protocol, you know, you're, you're able to say, OK, you know, we may may not like everything that that compound did, but at least we it, you know, at least it's a known known, you know, at least we know, know how it works and, and we can and we know basically how to how to do it um, and we can build from there. It really makes me think about the question that we just mentioned earlier, which is when what we're forking are um, smart contracts, when what we're forking is technical governance primitives and we're employing these um, governance networks and crypto economic systems that have inherent values that are embedded in them, how does one upgrade, you know? And that's, and I, I think about this a lot, which is I, I truly believe that token voting is actually an unsustainable means, a governance system for protocol, open source protocol ecosystems in the long term, and that there will be um, a lot of these protocol ecosystems will either upgrade or supplement governance um, with more modularized uh, systems. Um, that can also be based in crypto economic primitives like NFTs, or will be complete upheavals of you know how a system is governed in the first place. But I'm so interested, and I really don't have an answer to this question, but it's one that I'm thinking about a lot, is how do you design a strategy um, and how do you design a, a culture and how do you design the social infrastructure um, that allows uh, for the reevaluation of governance strategies? And I, I think I have a hunch that it's about continuously distributing influence and so having a mechanism of uh, continuously distributing governing power uh, to empower the people who are driving um, the project forward but it's really hard to know about how and and to think and to uh, imagine kind of how we see governance evolving in progressively decentralizing systems as they mature yeah, and the general question that I kind of wanted to come in with or, or the angle to highlight is sort of what additional challenges exist given that, especially given how prevalent token voting models are as of today, that there are these inherent links between, hey, you want to vote, but your thing can also, you know, if you hodl, you can get real rich one day, right? And so there's what complications does that add to being a good community participant? And does that unintentionally, does that inherent structure incentivize people to just want to exit? And that as soon as you're not happy, and if you have a way to hard fork that you like a little more and you think can get you, you know, decent return over time, is that the calculus that people are making? Or is that only a certain subset? And, you know, I love the 80-20 culture rule. And I, I would hope that 80% of humanity is more focused on culture than processes. But I, I don't know if that's actually the case. Are people more worried about what's how their wallet is looking as opposed to the real culture and meaning and values of an ecosystem? 
I think about this all the time. It's also how does financialization drive culture in the long term? If uh, early contributors are cashing out and leaving a project, what does that mean for the culture of the project um, that they created and the rest of the the holders and the stakeholders involved in the project? And I think that this is a, kind of an awkward conversation for a lot of people in crypto because, um, like, hot take, I think a lot of people, the, the fact that the fact of getting rich is actually almost part of an ideological culture as well. Like, I think that a lot of, um, and we've seen, and I'm kind of waiting for more case studies on this, but if you were, are you going to hold your airdrop or are you going to sell it to pay for your real world bills, right? These airdrops, which are signifying governing power in emergent networks are um, going to be, you know what I mean? Like also looked at, at in their monetary value. And so I think that there's kind of an awkward relationship with um, uh, protocol governance when it relates to um, uh, tokens um, because there is this uh, underlying subliminal financial incentive that is driving decisions. Um, and I think that in the long term, we'll start to see the relationship with stakeholders change as people start to cash out. Um, because again, a lot of these protocol ecosystems have investors who have to take returns. And so when that time comes, how does a system and a network and a governing network remain resilient to um, those inevitable financial actions in the same way that we ask what, how will our centralized platforms remain resilient to the eventual extraction that the profit incentive models that the corporations are driven by are you know, um, uh, aligned with. And so I think that this is something that I, I would love to hear more people's thoughts and people have thought about this and what will happen because I really don't know. And I think it's, it's something that uh, definitely keeps me up at night. I think you need to, you need to figure out the, those non-economic spaces and, um, and, and, and it is, it is a self-fulfilling prophecy. I mean, if, if we design all of our systems around economic nudges, we are going to become economic nudged you know, we're, we're, our receptors are going to change, you know, um, you know, this is something people in psychology have, have recognized, you know, we've done generations of psychological research on college students in the United States of America. And um, it turns out if you compare that work to, you know, uh, studies on college students in, you know, in sub-Saharan Africa, you might, you, you see very different psychological patterns, right? Because of the culture in which they exist, because there is less of a kind of individualist culture that they've grown up in. And so their receptors, you know, the, the ways in which they receive information in the world and process it is, it becomes different. And, um, and, and we run that risk. I mean, that's the kind of metaphysical risk of like, what are we doing to our humanity when, when everything is built on these incentives? Um, but, but kind of short term too, if you compare, like if I compare my, you know, like centralized commercial social media feed, Web2 feed with um, the Web3 feeds and these kind of fledgling social platforms, like I'll take the Web2 any day. Um, the Web3 feeds are full of this like short term is like token shilling, right? Because every th even if they're not shilling a token in the content, you know, they're looking, they're, they're, they're responding to incentive um uh, structures that where they actually stand to gain economically from something they say in web two, at least there was this, because these companies are extracting and, um, and manipulating their users. Um, they're trying to disguise the economics of the platform. And, and, you know, as much as we might dislike that, um, it does at least create a world in which people feel like they are in many people, you know, not the kind of manipulators, but the, you know, the, the 80%, you know, feel that they are um, engaged in a purely social space. And, and, they're, and, and you see people pouring their hearts out in ways that, you know, that just like have no economic calculus whatsoever. And those are the kind of beautiful moments, you know, in my view, in, in, in social media by and large. Um, and, and so, you know, we just see in that kind of crass short-term way, um, the way in which, you know, economic incentives can really harm culture. I mean, if, I, I think over and over of like the old classic anthropology of the gift, you know, the idea that if you put a price on a gift, it ceases to be a gift, right? Um, if you, you know, and of course there is an economy of gifts, 
right? You know, somebody, you know, if, if, if grandma gives my kids a gift, you know, we, ha we have to write that thank you note or else we're in big trouble. You know, there is a reciprocity. There is a set of expectations. But if, you know, if, if I were to send grandma, you know, the, the $54 that I saw that present was worth on Amazon, you know, that would be an insult. And, and I think we need to we need to recognize that so much of culture runs on forms of, of flows that that um, it not only are hard to capture in tokens and other kinds of quantifiable economic values, but actually cease to function when we do that. I think that an um, interesting culture dichotomy within crypto is people who view money and, and financialization, I, I say money really, as a chaotic good versus a chaotic evil, you know? And I think that this has always been the, the driving conversation in you know, the free software movement as well, which is, you know, wh which side are you on, right? And on one hand, everything that you just said, right? The financialization of everything just makes us financialize the social aspects of ourselves, um, which is incredibly harmful and is, uh, I think, now has caused many problems in humanity um, and can be uh, exemplified in uh, many technological trends as well. But on the other hand, the ability to create culture, to create markets, to um, use these hyper-specific primitives to build outside of mainstream financialization is incredibly powerful in like a very like wild magic type of way. And I think that it's... Um, trying to grapple with the power and the potential of this technology to financialize everything uh, and to incentivize everything, uh, which can be incredibly freeing versus the, um, the chaotic roller coaster that it kind of puts you on, you know, like, well, how do you remain resilient to the hyper financialization of the space? Uh, but in terms of culture, I mean, it's also incredibly, we were just talking about how culture, um, how culture pushes adoption. I think that sometimes financialization, you know, creates culture. And I think that a, a very large part of culture is financialized. And so there's also a way to create culture. And maybe this is like a really hot philosophical take that a lot of people are going <laughs> to really be against. But financialization, I think, can and stimulate and create culture, which then drives, you know, new means of adoption. And so I guess it's just figuring out how to wield that financialization. And there's a strong camp of people who disagree that that's ever possible. And I think that there's a camp of people and a lot of them in the crypto space who, you know, potentially believe that we can wield these financial tools to uh, kind of create new futures. Um, and I think that I, I, I flip between the two camps like day to day for real. <laughs> I, absolutely. And, and, you know, when you look at like classical free open source software, you know, the things that they failed to do in the architecture of that movement and that culture was they totally punted on governance and economics, right? There, There is, you know, you are not allowed to talk about governance. You're not allowed to talk about economics. Those things are, you know, they're taboo and they're still there, but they're hidden and they're weird and it allows corporate capture and it it demands like excess volunteer labor. Um, it, it drives out people who have care work and, and uh, don't have access to excess free time. Um, and so, you know, Absolutely. I mean, to put and and that's that's what I think one of the things that's so exciting about what crypto promises is it it puts an economic and governance layer at the heart of open source culture and op open source software. And, um, you know, so the call here, you know, from my perspective is is a balance. Right. Y you know, we this is the you know a, a tremendous opportunity to make things explicit that before have been hidden from view. Um but at the same time, we need to be aware, that, you know, careful of the dangers. Yeah, I just remember hearing uh, the first time I heard from someone the view of, uh, you know how you build decentralized communities? You rain money down on people. And the first time I heard that, I just got this visceral of just like, oh, God, that, sound, that sounds horrible. But it, in all fairness, also just being aware of the space, pretending that one is either good or evil while the other is the opposite is an overly reductionist view that isn't helpful. And to what both of you are saying, I mean, if I'm correct in kind of sussing this out, it's the honest and transparent experimentation, knowing that we don't know the suite of incentives that will actually get us to the kind of culture that will keep us on track for our goal. And 
we have to kind of play around with that and be honest that there is a financial component and there are big non-financial components and we don't know what that looks like. And for different communities and goals, that balance might be different. But I, I guess that to, to ask you both a question instead of just trailing off, like, what would be the experimentation you want to see more of in that direction? Is it on the honesty and openness? It is a specific type of experiment sort of, do you see any particular things keeping us from just making more of the experimentation progress before we can propose more frameworks and ideas? I think one that immediately comes to mind is, um, I guess like research driven work into what's working now. I, I really just think of like the work that the other internet squad is doing, um, which are evaluating governance of different systems and, and doing exactly also what Nathan did, which is evaluate how, what is governance for specific protocol communities? Cause it's not just the governance smart contracts that make up the ecosystem, right? Where is governance happening? How is it happening? What is participation and understand the different aspects of governance and start presenting observations and conclusions around participation and and the the values of and the culture of the space and before we can start defining culture i think it's trying to understand what aspects of these emergent networks actually impact culture. Um, and right now it's a patchwork of tools uh, that make up the social infrastructure behind these governing systems and it's evaluating those and and using these in-depth analyses uh, to drive conversations around what can be improved. Because if you have everything out in front of you, then you can say, well, this is interesting because this maybe doesn't align with this value of this project. Or if you don't know what the values of the project are, having everything in front of you um, allows you to kind of have those conversations um, uh, with the community. So I, I really do think that analyzing what governance is for different protocol communities is something that should be happening earlier than later. I know it's something that I've been trying to do with in the radical, which is a very early emergent ecosystem, and we're just activating governance. And my goal is for anything that's happening with governance to document it and put it in an open and accessible hub where it can be used to be tracked and engaged with uh, to support you know the growth of whatever's to come. And I think that we should all be trying to look at governance and really truly trying to understand it in relation to our communities and the role that we want to see, have it in the future. Um, and you know what? And getting people to steward that culture and within governing communities is also really important. So I think that that's like first and foremost before like diving into like experimentation yet is like truly understanding the authority surfaces and the playing field within your communities and ecosystems. Yeah. And the experiments I, I think are most important are how can you make sure that your economy is accountable to something, you know, to the people who are who are affected by it, and um, you know, this is this is that old like kind of liberal dream of you know wrapping the economy in a democracy, right? Um, but we can do that in a lot of different creative ways, and I'm really excited about the kind of the kind of exploration that's going on right now all all around us. I mean, you know, again, I work in like the cooperative business tradition, you know, but it's here in crypto that people are coming up with new voting systems every week. And, and the, the froth of this, of this world is, you know, it, it's just really exciting. Um, but, you know, I would, you know, caution each project or, or invite each project. It shouldn't be a caution to say, where are you holding your economy accountable to, you know, to the, to the real human needs at, at stake, the stuff that can't be captured in that economy. Um, Cause no economy is complete. You know, no economy is is able to see every externality um, and it shouldn't have to. Right. In some cases, that might mean embedding, you know, values at the center of what you're doing. So one hive, which I talked about earlier, you know, has this covenant at the center of what it does. If people violate the the, you know, the the natural language values expressed in that covenant, there's you know, there's a dispute resolution system that adjudicates those claims. Right. And and. Um, holds people accountable to those, to the crypt, through crypt, crypto economic methods to these non-economic values. Um, another way is to to do it at the infrastructure level, um, and to to set rules at the level of infrastructure um, so that individual projects can just be simple and focused on their economic goals. Right. So, for instance, you could consider an example like um, you know a project running on Ethereum. Uh, that 
that um, is just focused on, you know, this kind of financial transaction, right? But maybe at the level of Ethereum, there is some regulative, regulative me mechanism that says, okay, if any app built on this system does this thing, we're going to notice it, detect it, and, you know, not confirm those transactions. Um, and we, we, we see, you know, an example of this kind of, of this kind of external regulative mechanism in the, I think, very positive way in which the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission's expectation of sufficient decentralization has compelled projects that might not otherwise decentralize power and, and, and value um, to do so um, at the cost of, you know, a, a, as a way of avoiding having to file, you know, securities documents. Um, and, and, and those kinds of, you know, big picture value setting regulations, I think, can be actually really valuable. And we need to start thinking as this space explodes, you know, what kinds of values are written into the system? What kinds of values do we do we really need to start writing into the system? Um, and of course, it doesn't have to be uniform. Um, but, you know, I am concerned that there is. You know, there that the, the values written into these systems still, you know, are are values that treat us as solely economic beings, and, and and I think that's you know that's a dangerous mistake, and and the stakes are getting higher every day. Um, we we really need to, um, and I think uh, you know a lot of projects are, you know, center that conversation more uh, about what. You know, in what ways are our economics being held accountable um, to something else? Yeah, and just disclosing some of my personal views. I mean, I feel like the the economic side is kind of, in some ways, easier to default to because there's a, a clearer, more quote unquote rational why behind things. Whereas if you just pull away all the specifics of your life and you're like, why am I actually doing any of the set of things that I'm currently involved in? That can open up a can of worms that most people prefer to not uh, open up frequently. Yeah, it's and credible just, neutrality, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I, I think that sort of I always love trying to think of governance through an existential psychology lens. And what is meaning of life, identity? What do these questions inform here? Because I think these are questions we're not always able to be honest with ourselves about. So the more we can suss that out on the individual level, and then think of community and larger social structures, then we can kind of get a better sense of the interaction there. But I mean, there's so many amazing topics that we unfortunately haven't gotten to delve deeper into in terms of the role of, you know, very specific, explicit versus implicit social contracts and some of the nuances between those. I know we talked about the code of conduct, which is in that direction, but not, not uh, exclusively that, uh, you know, digging in a little more on the education side, the global aspect was something else, because I feel like a lot of crypto organizations don't always acknowledge, oh, yeah, yeah, we're global, we're global. But that means you're going to have people who have inherently different starting points of culture. And what are you doing to create shared language and knowledge and understanding? Um, and one thing that, that, that I really was hoping we would get into dig into, but unfortunately, such as time. Uh, but the whole question of how do you create a loop of continuous process diffusion in a system? That's just such a fascinating question. And what are, yeah, well, both on the human personality level of who are the kind of people who are willing to create that and say, I want to build this to never have power and to enforce that consistently. I don't know, is that individual differences, cultural differences, a mix of everything that leads to that? But yeah, I, it's been a lovely conversation. And I just want to give each one of you a chance to kind of wrap up with any thoughts or, or, or statements that, that are on your mind, uh, given what we haven't gotten to yet. But there's uh, never a shortage of what we could delve into. Everything that you just said could be a whole nother podcast, and I'd be very interested to dive into that as well. But I think that um, we're all entering this very interesting phase of governance as we start to see these protocol ecosystems start to mature and, and start to grapple with um, uh, not only the size of their treasuries, um, but the, uh, the size of their developer communities. Um, and I think that this these conversations at Nathan's work um, – all are driving the conversation forth on how we can be designing social systems within uh, technological, I mean, technical networks, right? And I think that that's an incredibly powerful uh, space to be in. And it's something that we've been bordering for a long time. And I feel that now that DAOs are a thing and people are doing governance without even knowing that they're doing governance, uh, we'll see more of a focus on um, experimentation uh, with how uh, we can be um, 
reevaluating and reconfiguring uh, uh, governance to support uh, different means of uh, culture in the long term. And so I, I feel like that there's a lot of really great people who are driving the conversation forth on this. Um, and as someone who's uh, now trying to implement these practices uh, in real time, I'm very interested for more, you know, roundtables and forums to um, get involved with uh, to kind of move that forward. So um, that's what I'll close with. Um, and so if anybody's interested in kind of continuing the conversation or has things that um, they'd like to share, you know, you can reach out on Twitter. Um, my Twitter is uh, Abby, A-B-B-E-Y underscore Ticom, T-I-T-C-O-M-B. And we'll make sure to include socials and any links cool. in the show notes for the episode. Yeah, lots of great conversations around your Twitter account. Um, I always love checking out what's <laughs> what's on the mind of you and all the people who you're arguing with. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, this conversation make me realize like the, you know, the, what I keep doing over and over in this space is like ask people to hold contradictions. Um, so some of my earlier work around decentralization, you know, it was like, yes, decentralization, but here's this weird thing. In order to get decentralization, you might need to intentionally centralize some things. Um, and that's okay. And, and it'd be better if you did that intentionally than if it just shows up. Uh, and, uh, and, and in, in these current questions of, of governance, um, that the ask is, okay, crypto economics is doing some really, really cool things and let's embrace that. Let's celebrate, you know, the, the creativity around here, but, you know, we also need, you know, the, to explore the space that is able to to counteract the very thing that is producing so much so much enthusiasm, you know that the, the possible, you know that in order to have um, systems that are accountable to us, we have to make sure that our systems don't get ahead of themselves, that they don't become so you know so powerful that we put so much trust in one thing, you know that we lose our ability to um, you know to to put it in check when it needs to be. And, and that, that ability to hold contradictions, you know, is, is, you know, I, I mean, it, it, some might say it's a, it's a kind of, um, it's a, you know, it's, it's a sign of a kind of mature mind, the ability to recognize the two things can be true at once that, that may, um, uh, that may seem to contradict each other. And I think similarly, the maturing of the, you know, the crypto ecosystem is going to require that kind of holding of contradictions, recognizing that we need to, you know, jump into and embrace these these exciting new possibilities while at the same time being able to kind of double down on their opposite. And also hold those contradictions to stay true to the values that we want to present because I think that there'll be a lot of externalities uh, facing like specifically the Web3 space that will challenge a lot of the values that uh, we're attempting to embed into our technology. And the best way to challenge and, and to combat that is to hold contradictions, which so I love that phrase so much, totally using that from now on for real. Is the crypto version of that phrase a uh, hodl contradictions or how does that work? But, um, anyway, sorry. Sorry to Biddle. end this with a bad joke. Biddle I'm so sorry that, that oh after gosh. such a good conversation, oh I took us there. <laughs> my apologies. But anyway, this was an awesome conversation. Thank you both for, for being part of it. Uh, and yeah, we'll make sure to, to include all of your uh, links. Uh, Nathan will include the link to your lab and Metagov. And uh, if y'all have any other relevant stuff, feel free to share and we'll make sure to share with our audience. We'll have a post on this on our forum to continue the conversation conversation and yeah just really appreciate uh taking the time to to be part of this and sharing your knowledge with others so that we can hopefully build this infrastructure of sharing uh and i know there are, uh to be extra meta there are research DAOs focused on DAO research now and like little things coming up so it's really exciting to to be part of this time so yeah thank you both thank you both thank you